from trying to tell them about their soul. Last in judgment, then they go. But they wanna go junction, wanna go wrong. Nuts I know, it's not about God, but I'm not involved. Nuts I know, only for this time though, next gen, next stuff might get Benito. When the time's up, they won't find no cheat code. I ain't no book, do you know where your soul goes when it's broke close? I think they want the world in peace, but they will never go in peace unless they find the Prince of Peace. And Jesus Christ will solve your needs. You need to find the Lord before your souls to cease. I'm out here on the street side, let me talk to the people here about God when the walking stop is there. Open ears on judgment day, what will they say that I wanna look and I got paid that will save your day and he will say, away from me, you sinful slave to the sinner's grave. Read this word about the end of days, yeah, they wanna know. I bet they wanna roll in peace, but uh, they will never go in peace unless they find the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ will solve your needs, I'll pray for you like Jesus, please, I'm on my knees, I plead the blood, strongholds will fall down with a fun, I see the cross, I see your love, I bet they want to roll in peace, but uh, they will never go in peace unless they find the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ will solve your needs, I'll pray for you like Jesus, please, I'm on my knees, I plead the blood, strongholds will fall down with a fun, I see the cross, I see your love. If you want to roll and go like that, you won't come back. Man's heart is wicked and they don't know that death is a trick with a one-way ticket now to get with it. Spirit conviction, making man fidget. If you do God, then you will just live it. Devil's a liar, making man wicked. Man's heart is wicked now to get with it. Yeah. Walk with the Lord like Jesus did. Walk with the Lord like Elijah did. Pray for the rain like Elijah did. I see the clouds, hands of a man. Let me handle it, man. If you know God, you can handle it, fam. Give to a man, plan of my God. Walking in faith, we're standing God. He knows your pain. Came as a man, so he knows your pain. Bled when he came. By his stripes we all are healed yeah. Through the storm we will be still yeah. Know his voice, heard his voice It's a choice, the one no him We will cut top that like Peter did We won't drop that like Peter did Yeah, yeah, I bet they wanna go in peace But no, they will never go in peace Unless they find the Prince of Peace And Jesus Christ will solve your needs I'll pray for you like Jesus, please I'm on my knees, I plead the blood Drunk holds will fall down with a fun I see the cross, I see your love I bet they wanna go in peace But no, they will never go in peace Unless they find the Prince of Peace Christ will solve your needs, I'll pray for you like Jesus, please, I'm on my knees, I can feed the blood, drunk holes will fall down with a fun, I see the cross, I see your love. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. can we welcome my pastor as he comes to preach the word of God. Amen. <laughs> I literally just told Roger as he was singing, uh, well, as we were just in our offering, that he's going to be doing special music. I've got a bit of an echo here. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Good. 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 Good to see everyone out. We're going to um, get right into it. So if you have your Bibles, Exodus 34, uh, verse 6 and 7. Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. If you have your Bibles here, uh, the scripture will come up on the screen. I just want to quickly grab your attention. And... I think the first thing that I want you guys to hold on to for today, this is something that I, if there's anything that I say today, I want you guys to walk away with this. God wants to give you more. Can everyone say that together? God, God wants to give you more. Turn to your neighbour, say, God, God wants to give you more. Turn to your other neighbour, say, God wants to give you more. God wants to give you more. There is more that God wants to give you. Yes, you're at a good place. Yes, you may be uh, uh, at a difficult place, but God wants to give you more. He wants to give much more than what you're experiencing at this very moment in time. I um, had a cousin um, who I went to school with. He lived actually in northwest London. And I, we went to school in east London. So he used to travel every day from northwest to east London. And this, he was a, a, a smart person. He was very, very smart, actually. He was a top set for everything. And um, I remember, just remember him, his, his brothers, his sister that used to come to the school as well. And he was a, a very, um, I, I would say, a person that would just keep to himself. He wasn't really a person that would go out there and, and speak to a lot of different people. Uh, but as we grew, grew closer together, as we started growing up together, we, we saw each other at family parties, we saw each other here and there. And I noticed one thing, and that was that his dad was never around. I noticed that I never saw his dad. I didn't question it, didn't even uh, question it. I didn't ask my parents, oh, what's happened? I just said, hey, you know what, maybe something's happened. I don't want to... to spark up anything, I don't want to arise anything in him, so let me not ask. 
Years go by now and I hear that his older sister is giving birth. So the family's excited. The first time a grandchild has come into the family. A niece has come in. And just weeks after his sister gives birth, the baby ends up passing away from a cot death. Everyone's upset there in the morning. You can imagine the atmosphere. It's very sad. Months go by and I just remember uh, having a conversation with different people and mum at this moment in time, she's struggling to just get her head around. How could I lose my baby? How is this possible? How could God allow this to happen? And what happens is she ends up going to a train station. She jumps onto the train track and she ends up committing suicide. And the reason why I say this story is because I found out that she had committed suicide from my mum. I was sitting down having a conversation with her. She tells me, oh, she's committed suicide. She jumped onto the train tracks and she said these words. She said she did exactly the same thing that her dad done. He took his own life by jumping onto the train tracks too. So there's, there's something here, there's something that's, that's not quite right here. How is it that a, a daughter would do exactly the same thing and take her life the same way that her dad did? Why is it that this could possibly happen? See, in life there are, are certain things that take place in, in our life that can lead us to a point where we make certain decisions. There are certain things that maybe they're not going the way that we expect it to go. Maybe things haven't panned out the way that we thought it would pan out. Maybe we've written plans and they haven't gone according to the way that we've written them. Now we, we make a decision. Sometimes this decision can affect the later generation. It can affect our children. It can affect our children's children. And so on and so forth. The weight of the decisions that we make, church, can affect people that follow after us. Because there is not just a, a physical thing that takes place, but a spiritual thing that begins to start happening. And a spiritual door that gets open. And here we read in our scripture, actually, Something transpires, which is, uh, uh, it goes on not just from one generation, but it goes on to the next and to the others, and it continues to move forward, continues to affect. So let's, let's read here this afternoon, if I can get a helper to help me read it in Exodus 34. If I can get someone to help me out. Yes, Frankie. Uh, Exodus 34, 67, please. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children hmm. and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Amen. Just uh, quickly highlight, visiting the iniquities of the fathers, upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This is where I've, I've got this inspiration for this text. Let's bow our heads and let's quickly pray. Father, I thank you, Jesus, for this time, God, that we could uh, gather together. Help us, God, to uh, bring guidance uh, into our lives. Help us, Jesus, that we would not walk uh, out the same way we walked into this place, God. We want to leave edified and transform God. Give us a vision and give us an understanding of all that you desire to speak and to do in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 There's a Spanish word that I want you guys to, to, to learn here today. You know, we, we don't just come to church to listen to the preacher, but we come to learn as well. Amen. Amen. Someone meant to say Amen there. You guys missed a good point there. But the, the word is Calentia. Can someone say that? Carencia. <laughs> Carencia, which means it, it describes a place where one feels safe. A place which one draws, uh, which one's strength of character is drawn. A place where one feels at home. It's also described by others as a hiding place. 
a place of, of privacy, a place of refuge, a sanctuary, a place uh, that people go to to retreat. And this is how many people see their home. They see their home as a calentia. Mm. I like the way it rolls off my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> they see this place as a home. They see, this, they see their home, should I even say, as a place where they can feel at peace. Yeah. Where the madness is going on outside. But hey, you know what? Let me go to my calentia. Mm. Because that's where I can find peace. That's where I can draw my strength from to go back out into the world. Calentia place where you can hide, where you can hide away from all the issues that's happening in life. Where you can hide away, where you can feel that, hey, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm being protected here, there's nothing that's going to hurt me here. Calentia. And this is how God wants his house to feel also. Because God wants to give you more. He wants you to feel the Calentia when you walk into his house. He wants you to feel at peace. He wants you to feel a sense of, hey, you know what, there, this is a hiding place. This is a place where I can draw strength from. Yeah. He also wants this for your mind as well. That your mind can be a place of peace. That your mind can be a place where you can draw strength. Where no one can attack you in any sort of way. But like the scripture that we just read. As I said in, in verse 34, in verse 7, sorry, it says, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children. There's an unwanted visitor that comes into our home. An, an unwanted visitor that, that comes and, and it's unexpected at times. We're not expecting things or, or words or, or phrases to pop into our minds. We're not expecting uh, curses to just come in. But that's what's happened. Some of these unwanted visitors, they, they come for a short term. Some, that they come and they stay a very long term. Who's ever had an unwanted visitor in their house before? Don't, don't put your hand on You don't need to. <laughs> When someone's coming to your house and you're thinking, Kyle, what are you doing here, man? Trying to get away from you. This is what our scripture is talking about. There are iniquities that are visiting. Yeah. They're invading our space. They're, they're wearing our clothes now. They're eating our food. They're burning our electric. That's what sounds like I'm describing my teenage son. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping us up all night. And it begins to not just be disturbing, but also a challenging, because it's challenging our patience now. It, it's challenging and bringing chaos and discomfort to a place where we're meant to feel at peace. Where we're meant to feel at home. Where we're meant to feel away from hostility. Where we're meant to draw strength from. And Karenfi is gone now. It's turned into a battle zone. Yeah. It's turned into a place of hostility. A place that, that's bringing out the emotions that you try to bury. A place that's bringing out the, 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 the reaction that you're saying, I'll never do again. The unwanted visitor brings a, a foul mouth. Brings unclean ideas. It doesn't play fair. It misleads us to, to making wrong moves, to making wrong judgments. Yeah. Thoughts in my mind is, hey, you know what? That person said or did this because they don't like me. But the unwanted visitor is the one that's telling us this. You see, what begins to happen here in our scripture is... It doesn't just say that it comes into your house and then it just stays. Yeah. It doesn't just stay, it doesn't just say, hey, you know what, it comes to visit you and, and then it torments you and then it doesn't torment anybody else. But what happens is, is that it begins to start trickling out of you, it begins to start having a, a reaction or, or some sort of uh, some, something is passed on. Yeah. It begins to proceed out. 
onto the next generation. It begins to proceed out onto your children. It begins to proceed out onto your friends, onto your family members. It just begins to proceed out. Because it's not happy with just being in one hole. It needs to bulldoze into another. It needs to break through into your bloodline, into your mind, into your life. It begins to start happening. The unwanted visitor. They're not invited. They're not, they're not welcome. These thoughts are, are not what I wanted. But the presence is just there. It just keeps coming. Yeah, I had a friend at school and he always used to talk bad about his dad. Oh, my, my dad's this, my dad's that. And his dad was an alcoholic. He used to drink all the time. Every time I saw, you know when you know someone's an alcoholic? It's not when they have the bottle, but when they have that metal flask. That's when you know this person's an alcoholic, because he's a professional. He's doing this properly. But yeah, he always had a metal flask and he always drinking, eyes bloodshot red, always staggering all over the place, never dressed presentable. Thinking to, I always used to think to myself, God, doesn't he look at himself in the mirror before he leaves his house? His friend always cussing, this guy's such a waste of space, my dad. Oh, I hate my dad, he's so stupid, he's so lazy, he's so this, he's so that. No word of a lie, by year 11, no. my friend walking to school and you can see blood, eyes shot red. Yeah, I just needed a drink to just calm down my shakes. Yeah, I just needed a fag so, so that I can just concentrate and the stress can just go. The thing that he disliked the most about his dad, he eventually became dependent on. The unwelcome visitor. Person that I didn't want to come in the first place. Person that I didn't like. You see, this isn't a coincidence, but this is a spiritual incident. Yeah. This is something that's spiritual that's happening here. It's unwanted sin that's creeping into your life. Maybe it's come from a previous generation. Maybe it's come from generations before. But there is an inheritance that comes and it creeps and it comes into your life and it occupies spaces that have been left. That's right. Occupies things, not just physically but also spiritually. We say to ourselves, you know what? I, I don't like the feeling of this unwanted visitor. Let me jump into a relationship over here. But no, I'm not really, let me go over here to this relationship. But, and then it's, I don't like the feeling of this unwanted visitor in this job that I'm in. Let me go to this job over here. And then it's like, no, I don't really like this job. Let me go to a job over here. And life just keeps jumping city to city, place to place, person to person, friendship group to friendship group, habit to habit. Because the unwanted visitor, it, it makes us do things that we don't even like doing. And then the question comes, what's, what's wrong with me? Why am I doing this? Why am I feeling this way? Why can't I change? Why can't I make a decision and stick with it? The presence of the unwanted visitor coming into your home, changing your thought process. Maybe this is just how it's meant to be for me. Mm. Who's ever said that to themselves? I've made crazy decisions here. I've, I've done this, I've done that. And you're trying to change, but then you, you can't change. And then you're saying to yourself, maybe this is just how it's meant to be for me. What did I say at the beginning? Who remembers? Oh, you got to say it with more conviction. If you, if you remember, you got to say it like you know what I say. What did I say at the beginning? God wants, God wants to give you more. We're stuck because we're, we're saying to ourselves, this is how it's meant to be. I can't see God help me in this situation. But the reality is, God wants to give you more. He doesn't desire 
for you to be in this place where you're bound. He doesn't desire for your children to face the same ordeal that you're facing at this very moment. But he wants to give you more. See, what's being spoken about in regards to the iniquities is a, a demonic personality that's operating in the spiritual realm. It inherits one generation and then goes on to the next and then goes on to the next. It's a natural process, actually, of life. Even in the physical realm, when your parents or grandparents will pass away or will pass on, what happens is, is you get some sort of an inheritance. Maybe it's property, maybe it's money, maybe it's a, a, a business, something that you grab. From that, it's a natural process. Maybe they've acquired it. Maybe they've obtained it through the inheritance from their previous generations. Yeah. And the same thing happens spiritually as well. Comes in through the bloodline, and now you've obtained it. And what begins to happen is now you become an owner of this thing. Yeah. My mum lived with unforgiveness in her heart. Now you're living with unforgiveness. You're the owner of this unforgiveness. Yeah. My mom lived with anger and bitterness in her heart. Now, now you're the owner of anger. My mom lived with addictions and, and, and abuse to different substances. Now you're the owner. Mm. A sociologist a, a study showed these two families, a man named Jonathan Edward and Max Jutes. I think I've got a picture of this. And they studied these two people from five years, five generations back, actually. It's the, it's the second slide uh, after the main one. Uh, the first man, Jonathan Edwards, he was a preacher. He lived his life uh, for God. He was a very well-respected preacher in his day. And he was actually heavily involved in the face in the first Great Awakening Revival. And they studied and they saw his lineage 150 years after he passed away. And this is what comes of it. One U.S. vice president, one dean of law, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 militant officers, 80 public office holders, a uh, hundred lawyers, a hundred clergymen, and 280 college graduates. And then there was this other man named Max Duke, who came from the actual, the, the same state that Jonathan Edward came from. This man, Matt Dukes, he was an atheist, actually. He didn't live his life in any sort of godly way, but they traced his life back 150 years after he passed away. And this is what came from his lineage. Seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convictions, 310 were paupers, 440 were physically wrecked by addicted, addiction to alcohol. And of the, hundred, of the uh, 1,200 descendants, 300 died prematurely. Is this a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that uh, two people that come from the same place, two different decisions that they made in life, yes, but yet this is the outcome. This is the, their family tree. Decisions that we make today will not just impact us. It will not just be a decision that's just for the here and now. It's a decision that's for the next generation. It's a decision that can stay in your lineage for the next five generations even. Yeah. See, life itself is about making decisions, church. As we know, we're not perfect. As we know, we've made some bad decisions in life. There are some decisions that we can say that, hey, you know what, I'm not too proud of. Certain decisions that I've made in life, I can't even say in front of the pulpit because I'm not too proud of these decisions. But when you know what is right and you still do what is wrong, 
when sin proceeds from your life and disobedience and rebellion continues to play out in your life, it's not just going to affect you, it's going to affect your children as well. It's going to affect the next generation too. Because the more you feed it, the more you invite it in, the more you welcome it in, it's ultimately going to weigh down on your children. It's ultimately going to weigh down on your next generation. Bitterness doesn't just happen in a process. It's not just, hey, you know what, uh, I'm bitter, I'm angry, and, and it just came today. No, it's a process that takes time. Because you're going to allow it to sit on you. You're going to invite it in. You're going to encourage the thoughts of bitterness. You tell yourself, that, you know what, because I'm angry, because I'm hurt by this person, this is what I'm going to do. Because this person let me down. This is what I'm going to attack them with. In Matthew 12, 43 to 45, it speaks about an unclean spirit. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he came, he, found, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. They enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it also be with this wicked generation. Here is a man that, at the beginning, he makes a good decision. He makes a decision to get rid of this unclean spirit. And what does the unclean spirit do? It wanders around. It's looking for another house, but he can't find another house. So what does he say to himself? Let me go back to where I came from. As he's gone back, he finds, he realizes, hey, you know what? These rooms are still empty, still looking nice and clean. See, we can make a good decision to follow Jesus, yes, but decisions need to be followed up. Yeah. Good decision after good decision is what Christianity is about. It's not about being perfect. It's not about being, hey, you know what, you can't sin anymore because you're under the blood. No, it's about making good decision after good decision. It's about saying to yourself, you know, I have option A and I have option B. I have the wrong way, I have the right way. Let me just go the right way. Yeah. You continue to make good decisions, you will fill your house with different things. When the, the unclean spirit comes, it's not going to be able to even step into the house. Because right, yeah. it's too full. Yeah. Good decisions need to be made even after the first decision of following Jesus. See, there, there is a pattern that's, that's building up here when it comes uh, uh, to generational curses. There's a pattern, and that pattern is that things that linger don't just disappear. Yeah. Things that, that are, are maybe patterns of behavior, maybe patterns of habit, maybe patterns of emotions, they don't just disappear. There was a, a book that was written. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book for the life of me, I don't remember. It was, a, by, it was about a man named Rooster Bogle, and he was a criminal. He, he knew how to, to bump the system in any sort of way. And he made uh, uh, multiple, he made loads of money actually from this. And he encouraged loads of different people, including his family members, to also do the same. But this man, he drove, to, he drove past a prison once. And he had his three boys in the back. And he turns to his boys as he's driving past the prison. And he says, look boys, this is the place that you're going to spend your adulthood life. This is going to be your home. Can you imagine a father saying that to their kids? This is going to be your home. This prison that we drive past, it's going to be your home. And 50 years had gone by, and uh, this book says that 60 family members ended up in prison, wow. including his boys. His mom was in prison. His sisters were in prison too. Is this a coincidence? 
Is it a coincidence that patterns of behavior follow after? Is it a coincidence that things that you say, your children will say also? Is it a coincidence? It's a decision that we need to start making that will break these coincidences. It's a, a decision that we would need to say, hey, you know what, it needs to end here. It needs to stop right now rather than it continuing on. <coughs> In Ezekiel uh, 18, uh, God is speaking to the children of Israel and he's telling them, hey, you know what, you guys, you guys are, are wrong, man. The sins that you guys are involved in, it, it, it's wrong. And, and the, the response that the children of Israel give is, hey, you know what? It's not the sin that we've done, but it's our previous generation. And God turns to them and says this, the soul who sins shall die. Soul who sins shall die. Quite similar to what Jesus had said uh, when they had brought the, the, the woman that was caught in adultery, cast the first stone. He without sin shall cast the first stone. We've all made some bad decisions. We, we, we can admit that. We've all made decisions that we're not too proud of. We have to understand this. That as much as we've made some bad decisions, this is not just a, a matter of life and death, but this is a matter of the next generation. Because mm -hmm. dysfunction can come. Hatred can come. This uh, illusion can happen. It's not me, it was them. It wasn't what I did, it was what he made me do. This can be us not understanding that we need to sometimes, we, we, we need to take responsibility. That's, yeah. that's, that's how it is. We just need to take responsibility. Responsibility for what has taken place. Responsibility for what we are doing, for what we've allowed to manifest in our lives. We need to take responsibility. We're going to pray, church. We're going to pray. But be before we do so, just as I close, Galatians 3, 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, mm -hmm. having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is the one who hangs on the tree. Jesus had seen this from the very beginning. That, hey, you know what? There are going to be things in your life that you're not going to have control of. There are going to be things in your life that's going to lead you to a place of darkness. But I need to come and break that curse. I need to come and bring healing and bring restoration. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for us. He died because God wants to give you more. He died because he, through the, the things that we do, we're unable to break this, this, these curses, but it's only by the power of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's only by the power of his blood. So I'm going to leave us with three things, three things before we, we, we close off. The first thing is acknowledge and repent. That's the first thing that we need yeah. to do, recognize. Recognize that there are, are things that's operating in my life. Recognize that, hey, you know what, I've sinned. John, uh, 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Second thing is declare freedom. We've got to be able to speak and say to ourselves, I am free. When, when Frankie testified last week, that was her saying, hey, you know what? There are things that's happened in my life. There are things that I've made decisions on that I'm not too proud of, but now I am free. Amen. Revelations 12, 11, it says, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the words of their testimony. Mm. You've got to speak freedom. Yeah. Declare the freedom that Christ has given you. And then the last thing is uh, build a new legacy. You've got to begin to start teaching yourself and also your children that there are different ways of living, <laughs> that there are different things, there are different responses that I can live. 
There are different ways that I can respond to the, the, the hate or, or the hurt that people have put me through. Yeah. Not the same way that my, my mother, not the same way that my grandparents did. God says, I want to give you more. I do, but there are things, there are family curses that need to be broken. There are family curses that need to be cancelled. Before you walk into the life that I desire for you. Because if I, I give you more in the state that you're in, then it's just going to hurt you even more when it's taken away. God wants to give you more. Do you believe that? Amen. God wants to give you more. He wants to give you more. Amen. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes here this afternoon. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.